If you'll stand with me this morning as we go into our call to worship. Uh, today uh, is John chapter 1, verse 43 through 51. John writes, The next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda in the, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, Nathanael said to him, Can any, anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus said to Nathanael, Coming towards him, Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said to him, of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip came to you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. And Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than, the, than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open up 
and the angels of God ascend and descending and descending on the Son of Man. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for this day and this time that you brought us here. Lord, that we can uh, come here today and worship you and praise your name. And Lord, I ask that you would be with, uh, with Mr. Davis, Daryl Davis, as uh, he brings your word today that uh, the gospel will uh, just be evident in that. What he says uh, digs deep roots in our hearts that no one can pull them out. And Lord, be with us now as we continue to worship you today, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. You stand with me once more. So our, our speaker today uh, is Ms. Uh, Reverend Daryl Davis. Sorry, I said that wrong time. Uh, Reverend Daryl Davis. Um, uh, he is uh, he heads up the uh, giving uh, giving others eternity ministries. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. Uh, and so I will let I'll allow him to tell you more about that uh, as um, as he's up here. Uh, actually, um, Marty sent me your resume. And I saw that you used to uh, pastor at Bailey ba Bailey Baptist Church. I'm from Nash County. Oh wow! And so there's a little little connection there. I saw that two five two number, so I was like, okay, uh, I, I recognize that. Uh, me and my wife are from from Nash County, I'm from Middlesex actually. So there's just a little bit of connection there. Uh, so, uh, but I would ask uh, Mr. Daryl to come up here uh, and go ahead and bring God's word to us. Thank you, Matthew. Hang on, let me get this thing turned on here. There we go. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Sorry, every every church you go to has a different mic system. You have to kind of figure it out, you know. But uh, anyway, hope you guys are doing well today. I'm so excited to be with you, to be able to share the Word of God with you. I tell you what, uh, I got to thinking about this. I said, you know, you guys are so Baptist, you have it in your name twice. <laughs> That's awesome, you know. <laughs> So having been a lifelong Southern Baptist myself, I, I appreciate it so much. But anyway, I'm excited to be with you this morning to be able to share God's word. And uh, I have known your interim pastor, Brother Paul, for a very long time. In fact, uh, 
when I first went into the ministry of evangelism, I started attending the evangelist retreats over in Caraway. And Brother Paul and his wife Faye were among the first evangelists that I had met. And so I very much appreciate Brother Paul, and he has been an encouragement to me throughout the years of ministry. And uh, I'm praying for his speedy recovery. So just to tell you a little bit about what I do as an evangelist, uh, a majority of my ministry is actually done outside of the four walls of the church. Uh, in fact, I, I tell people I preach where there's no amen corner. Okay, I get a lot of oh my. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so we do a lot of ministry on the streets, evangelism, uh, especially in downtown Raleigh. Uh, we go and preach at the bus station. We go and preach at the abortion clinics. Uh, we also preach on the NC State campus when the students are there. And then we travel to places to share the gospel as well. Um, the other week I was in Ocean City, Maryland uh, on the boardwalk. And we were down there sharing the gospel with uh, a lot of high school students who were there to celebrate graduation. And I uh, just came back from a evangelist conference in Kentucky. Uh, so I'm not Kentucky, Tennessee. So uh, I'm still kind of uh, dealing with the fatigue of all the busy couple of weeks. But I do appreciate your prayers for the ministry that God's called us to do. Uh, after I left the pastorate, I spent about three years trying to consider what God wanted me to do and praying about it. And no other door opened other than for me to go back into full-time evangelism. Because before I took that pastorate, I was a full-time evangelist. And I traveled and did a lot of ministry in other countries. In fact, God's given me the opportunity to be in 11 countries and 18 states since 1999. And just sharing Jesus in every kind of context you can think of. To Him be the glory because He did it all. Yes. And so now we're going back to the ministry of sharing the gospel wherever God opens the doors. And you know, I've been encouraged to see him raising up a lot of younger people that are going into evangelism and sharing the gospel on the streets, taking the gospel to people. That's been a very exciting development that I've seen over the past few years. And so we were with 15 people this, year, this uh, last week who were doing that type of ministry learning how to be more effective in that kind of ministry. And so we're seeing that pop up everywhere. You know, amongst the early revivals that took place here in our nation, uh, street preaching and public open air preaching was a very, uh, a very powerful factor in that. And so uh, the gospel needs to be taken outside of the four walls of the church. So again, thank you for praying. Well, you know, Billy Graham one time was speaking to a convention of newspaper editors, and he shared this story about the old days when there were guards who were stationed at railroad crossings to stop traffic as the train approached. There was this one town that a train had hit a horse and buggy and had killed three people who were riding in the horse and buggy. So there was an investigation. And during the investigation, they questioned the crossing guard and they asked him about what happened. Had he been there? Yes, he was, he was there. Had he faithfully waved his lantern to warn the people off? Yes, he had done that. And so he was cleared of responsibility for the accident. But years later on his deathbed, he finally confessed the truth. He said this, they forgot to ask me if my lamp was lit. <laughs> Is your lamp lit for Jesus? That's a real relevant question and I think we need to ask today of ourselves. Is our lamp lit? Are we warning others uh, to flee from the wrath to come? Are we sharing the gospel? and shining our light before men. You know, that's what Jesus said we were supposed to do, right? He said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And you all remember that old song, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Come on now, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Yeah, that's a very powerful little song. 
We don't need to dismiss that just as something that children do. It's a truth that we can take home with us. So in the passage that was just read by Brother Matthew, we see the accounts of some people coming to Jesus, mainly because of the fact that there were others who chose to shine their light and invite people to come and see who Jesus was. I saw some statistics the other day that honestly were quite alarming. Lifeway did some research and said that 71% of non-believers surveyed had said that a Christian had never shared with them how to become a Christian. And then, <laughs> this is even more startling, 27% of the Christians that were surveyed by Barna said that it was wrong to share your faith with another person. Wrong. Now, if that doesn't trigger you, I think you need to check your commitment to Christ. Amen. Because we are the messengers that God intends to use to reach the world with the gospel message. And we have a responsibility according to Scripture. Each and every one of us, not just the pastors and the evangelists, but all people. Amen. And so today I want to share with you some truths in this passage here. Because here's a very important truth that we need to know. Found people find people. Amen. Found people find people. In other words, if Jesus found you, are you going out to find others? Are you going to tell them about his love and his mercy and his grace? Are you going to tell them about the cross and how Jesus who did not deserve to die, went to the cross and died for you and rose again on the third day. You see, that's what we are commissioned by God to do. In the latter part of chapter 1, John the Apostle records the account of Jesus calling some of his first disciples. And these were some of the very first interactions that he had with them. Those would eventually become his closest followers. Let's see what it says again one more time. It says, one of John's disciples, Andrew, heard, and then we're backing up here a little bit, John the Baptist preaching about Jesus, the Lamb of God, and followed Jesus. Jesus invited Andrew to come, and you will see. Right away, Andrew found his own brother, Simon Peter, and said to him, we have found the Messiah. And then a little further in the account, we see where Jesus decided to go to Galilee on the very next day. And there he found Philip and he told Philip to follow me. Well, after he told Philip to follow me, what did Philip do? It says right away, Philip found Nathanael and said, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote. You see, there's two things that Andrew and Philip had in common. They were first found by Jesus. And then immediately they went out and found someone else for Jesus. In other words, both men followed the example of the Lord and went to find people. Didn't Jesus say that the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost? Amen. That was his mission statement. Among all the things that Jesus came to do, he came to heal. He, he, he came to restore sight to the blind. The biggest thing he came to do was to seek and save that which is lost. And let me step aside here for a moment and talk about that word lost. You see, Scripture describes those who don't know Jesus as being lost. And we might think of that as a negative word, but in fact, it's actually a positive word. Lose your wallet and what are you going to do? You're going to go look for it. You're going to keep find, looking for it and, and tearing up the house until you found it. You're going to seek it because it's important. It has value. And so when God talks about people being lost in the scripture, it shows the value that they have toward him. They're made in the image of God and therefore they're worthy of redemption through Christ. And so we see that. I want to make three deeper observations about uh, Andrew and Philip here that I think we ought to imitate. The first one is this. These men had a conviction about who Jesus was. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah, the long-awaited one that was promised to Israel from the very beginning of the word. 
Even in Genesis, we see Jesus being prophesied about to Adam and Eve. And so Jesus was this long-awaited Messiah, and they had a conviction in their heart that that's who he was. A conviction is a convinced conscience. A conviction is a convinced conscience. So if we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and that he is the only way to heaven, then that conviction should move us to reach lost people. Otherwise, it's not a conviction. It's just a nice thought about Jesus. Do your convictions about Jesus move you to take action, to reach others? Also, we see that these men had a concern for their family and their friends, which stirred them to action. You see, Andrew, immediately after hearing about Christ and being invited to follow him, went and found his brother, Simon Peter. How many of you have family members that are lost? Amen. I hope you're praying for them on a daily basis. And then Simon, uh, after that, Philip went and he found Nathaniel. And so how many of you have friends that are lost? Okay. One of the bad things about being a Christian, and I've seen this over the years, is the very fact that the longer we are Christians, the fewer lost people we seem to know. And how are we going to reach them if we don't know them? So we've got to continue to be in the world, but not of the world. That's what Jesus did. He went and he ate with sinners and tax collectors, but he didn't sin with sinners and tax collectors. How many people that you know need Jesus in your circle of influence? Because as Christians, we tend to kind of hole up inside of the castle here. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we, we roll up the drawbridges when we see the things that are going on out there in the culture. Instead of going to them and bringing the light to them, we just kind of huddle up and hope for the best. That's not a victorious church, my friends. Jesus said you were more than a conqueror. Come on, did you hear that? You are more than a conqueror. According to the word of God. Charles Spurgeon said this. He said, have you no wish for others to be saved? Then you are not saved yourself. Be sure of that. That's some strong stuff. We need to be like Paul was. Romans chapter 9 verse 3. Paul said, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. What is Paul saying there? Paul is saying basically this. If he could lose his salvation in order to see his brothers Israel uh, of Israel saved, then he would give it up. Now, I don't think I've quite reached that point yet. But that's not really the point. The point is this. Paul had such a burden for the people who didn't know Christ. That he said if it were possible. He would give up his salvation. Do you have that kind of burden? And then third we see that these men initiated a life changing conversation. With those whom they were concerned about. Romans ten fourteen. How will they call on him and whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Without someone proclaiming the truth of the gospel? How are they going to hear? We can't automatically assume that they're going to get it somewhere. And then it says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, in Fuquay, Verena, and Wake County and North Carolina, and to the world. Right? Research from Lifeway showed that 55% of Protestant churchgoers, that would be us, shared the gospel with no one in the last six months. No one. Not a single soul. 
And I'm not trying to guilt trip people here. I'm just trying to wake us up to the reality that we've got a job to do, folks. And we've been equipped to do that job. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. You've been sitting under Bible preaching faithfully for years. You've been in Sunday school under Bible teaching for however many years. You've got what you need. When are you going to use it? The next thing we see here is this. Skepticism happens. So when Philip went and found Nathanael and invited him to consider Jesus, Nathanael responded with skepticism. He said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That was a, a kind of a common saying in that day. I grew up in a small town in northeastern North Carolina, Northampton County, a town called Conway. And honestly, there's not much in Conway. And even less nowadays. The one big place of employment, Georgia Pacific, <clears throat> shut down. And so this would be kind of like saying, can any good thing come out of Conway, North Carolina? Nazareth had a, a really bad reputation as being kind of a backward place. To be from Nazareth was to be despised almost, almost as much as from being from Samaria. But listen, folks, not everyone who hears about Jesus is going to trust him immediately. When you do go out to share, you're going to encounter some people that are skeptical, some that are going to doubt. Don't give up. You're just planting a seed. You may just be watering a seed. You may be cultivating the soil, but one day God will give the increase and there'll be a harvest. Amen? Amen. That's what I believe. I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations on the street over the years. And trust me, I go to places. God sends me to these places that you wouldn't think that people would even listen. We go to New Orleans during Mardi Gras every year. Go out on Bourbon Street. Told people that one time. They said, I go to New Orleans during Mardi Gras. And they're like, but you're a preacher. <laughs> I'm not going there to party. I'm going there to make heaven party. Amen. But I can tell you there have been many a counter I've had out there on Bourbon Street where I thought, well, that didn't do much good. But then the Holy Spirit reminds me that the word of God will not return void. And that's what we need to remember also. When we proclaim God's word, it's going to go out and it's not going to return void. Now, let me just tell you here, skepticism isn't a bad thing. When people are skeptical about the gospel, it's not a bad thing if they are open to the truth. Because there are some people who have to be convinced. Some people who have to have a little more information. Some people who have to have some time. Ultimately, we know the Holy Spirit is the one that does the work. But being a skeptic isn't bad. Now, it's a different situation if they're skeptical and, and they're not open then that is a matter of their will versus reason. One of the questions I use a lot of times when I'm out talking to people, when I'm witnessing, is this. If you were wrong, would you want to know? If you were wrong, would you want to know? If you were wrong about the most important beliefs that you have, would you want to know that? Now, that's a question you have to be very careful with because they can throw that question back on you. And I would respond, absolutely. If I'm wrong about Jesus, I want to know. But I'm pretty sure I'm not. Because he saved me and redeemed me and put me on his path. I think it's much better to have a skeptic who investigates the claims that they hear before deciding than it is to have someone who just kind of falls for anything. Well, you've probably heard this before, right? If it's on the internet, it's got to be true. Not too long ago, there was a video posted of, on TikTok, and the video had footage from Switzerland showing the beautiful mountains there. And the person on the video said that this was actually a place in North Carolina. 
Do you know a lady drove from Florida to actually go see if those were the mountains? <laughs> she didn't investigate the truth. And when you have a skeptic that's not willing to investigate the truth, then basically you just need to pray for that person. Don't give up, but pray for them. Listen, it says in Acts chapter 17 that the people of Berea uh, were commended because they didn't just take Paul at his word when he preached. It says that they searched the scriptures every day to see if what he preached was true. Are you searching the scriptures every day to see what the men of God standing behind this desk preach are true? <clears throat> Paul wrote, test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Now, Philip, how did Philip respond to Nathaniel's skepticism? Did Philip just say, oh, you're such a heathen. Uh, you go to hell if you want to. Did he respond that way? No. Did Philip say to Nathaniel, well, Nathaniel, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. I had a conversation out there on the Ocean City Boardwalk the other week. This woman approached me and felt like it was her duty to come and tell me that I should be open to the idea that God has many sons and daughters and all these different religions are just paths to get to God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Did Philip just tell him, well, Nathaniel, you need to read the latest apologetics book from Lifeway, 10 Reasons Why You Ought to Believe Jesus is the Messiah. No. Philip simply said, come and see. Come and see. Check it out yourself, Nathaniel. Go look for yourself. Investigate for yourself. Come on, let's go. Check it out. Doesn't the Bible say in Psalm 34, 8, taste and see that the Lord is good? Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. In order to really understand the gospel, we've got to taste and see that the Lord is good. Philip again here is following the example of Jesus by inviting Nathaniel to come. Jesus first called John and Andrew telling them to come and see. And then, of course, here we see Philip calling Nathaniel. It says, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Now, if you don't have enough confidence in the gospel to invite people to come and see then maybe you don't have any confidence in the gospel at all I've said this for a long time as an evangelist because I think I've seen it in churches the church needs a revival of confidence in the power of the gospel to save whosoever will whenever and wherever it's proclaimed because we seem to have lost that today we seem to lost. Well, you just got you got to build up some street cred with people before you share Jesus. Well, you you just got to take them in and put them in a Bible study, and then eventually maybe they'll come to Jesus. My Bible says, "All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. Go therefore." And so, as a follower of Christ, you have been deputized with that same authority to proclaim the message of Christ. Look at the encounters that Jesus had with people. He engaged them with the gospel. We need to do the same, my friends. Yes. The gospel can stand on its own two feet. Yes. Finally, I want to see this. Evidence opens eyes, but God is the one who opens hearts. The evidence may open their eyes, but God is the one who opens hearts. 
as we look at this encounter, we see all of a sudden it seems like Nathaniel has had an amazing change of heart because he came to Jesus and, and Jesus confronted him with some very prophetic truths here. And there has to be something deeper going on behind the scenes that we cannot see. Jesus looked at him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. And Nathaniel probably thought, What? How do you know me? <laughs> How do you know these things about me? Well, we know that Jesus knows these things about all of us because it says at the end of John chapter 2 that Jesus himself knew what was in man. In other words, Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. Jesus knew Nathaniel's heart. Jesus knows your heart. And so Jesus was able to speak into his life. After all, Jesus is God in the flesh. That's what Scripture says. Scripture says that Jesus came and took on the form of a servant and went to the cross. Jesus said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So he knew exactly what was happening with Nathaniel before Philip even approached him. Now it could have been that Nathaniel liked to go and pray and meditate on the word while sitting under a fig tree in the shade. But that expression, under the fig tree, was actually an expression used by rabbis to refer to meditating on the Word of God. And so it could have been that Nathaniel's devotional life caught Jesus' attention. I don't know. I just know that Jesus knew his heart. And because of that, Nathaniel responded, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. What a powerful profession of faith. He confessed that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, the rightful king of Israel. Even then, after Nathaniel heard the evidence of who Jesus was, it just seemed like it was a sudden change of heart to me. His eyes were open because of the evidence, but ultimately, God is the one that opened his heart to the truth. And we see that in other places in Scripture where God opened up the hearts of people who believe to the truth. And we can have the best arguments for what, uh, who Jesus was and why you should believe, but it's only God who opens up the heart. What did Jesus say in John 6, 44? He says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on that day. Listen, if you are seeking Jesus today, it is only because Jesus is seeking you. Stop running. Surrender. Trust Christ as your Savior. Because, you know, just coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. If you went into McDonald's today, would you become a Big Mac? <laughs> so walking in the doors of the church doesn't make you a Christian. If mama and daddy were Christians, that doesn't make you a Christian either. I hope they set a good example for you. Unfortunately, I didn't have that example when I was growing up. I did have an uncle who took me to church. But that doesn't make you a Christian just because mama and daddy did it. You have to have your own personal relationship with Christ. And it is by grace through faith that you are saved. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. What happened in the life of Nathaniel was the work of the Holy Spirit. I know in Baptist churches we tend to be a little afraid of the Holy Spirit because we've seen the excesses that take place in other denominations. But let me just assure you that the Holy Spirit, when it comes to sharing the gospel with others, is your best friend. Because he will remind you of what you need to say during that time. You have, to remind, you have to rely on him. Look, this is what it says in John 16, verses 8 through 11. Talking about the Holy Spirit. When he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. 
concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. You see a progression of the gospel in these words here. First it begins with acknowledging our sin. That we've all come short of the glory of God. No matter how good a person we might think we are, compared to God's standards, we fall short. You say, Daryl, I'm okay. I've never murdered anybody. Really, have you ever told a lie before? You ever taken something that didn't belong to you, even something small? You ever used the name of the Lord in vain? Those are three of the Ten Commandments, and James says if you break one of them, you're guilty of breaking all of them. And so because of that, God must punish us for our sin. Because He is a righteous God. Yes, He loves us, but He is a holy God. The good news is Jesus went to the cross to take the punishment that you and I deserve for sin. He shed His precious blood so that we could be forgiven. It says in Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, no forgiveness. And so what happens when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, Jesus bears that sin for us on the cross, and then in turn, He places His perfect righteousness on us. It's called the great exchange. So that when we believe and have faith and have trusted Christ, then we have the righteousness of Christ in our spiritual bank account. Because apart from Jesus, we are sinful and rebellious. <laughs> Let me get back to where I was going here. Wherever you and I proclaim the gospel to someone, whenever, we do so in full reliance upon the Holy Spirit. We're praying and trusting that the Holy Spirit is going to use that message to convict the person that's hearing the gospel. And even if that person doesn't repent and believe in Jesus, we're still trusting and praying and believing that the Holy Spirit is speaking to their heart in ways that we cannot. Because the Holy Spirit has the power to break through a hardened heart. I want to share this story with you as I'm wrapping things up. Years ago, I was on the island of Exuma, which is in the southern Bahamas. I was out there suffering for Jesus, guys. Yeah. I'm telling you, beautiful place. Probably the most beautiful place I've seen. Crystal clear blue water. Oh, my goodness. But we were there to witness during this regatta. Regatta is a sailboat race. Very popular in the Bahamas. The people of the Bahamas build their own sailboats, train with them in order to race other sailboats. And so every year they have a huge regatta called the Annual Exuma Family Island Regatta. And so during the daytime we see racing, at night we see parties. There's a place called Regatta Point where people have little booths set up and they sell food, they sell alcohol, and it's just a big Mardi Gras type atmosphere. Maybe not quite that bad. Well, as I was out there, a man named Ramon strolled up to me. And Ramon had three solo cups of alcohol in his hand and half a bottle of liquor under his arm. <laughs> and so I hand him a gospel track. And he's looking at it. He says, well, what's this? And I said, well, it's a little booklet to tell you about how much God loves you. And so as he looked at the book, he kind of hung around a little bit. So I just took it as the fact that the Holy Spirit wanted me to witness to him. So I asked him, I said, Ramon, if something were to happen to you to die, heaven forbid, would you be 50, 75, or 100% sure you'd go to heaven? He had no idea. And so I began to share the gospel with him. I shared the scripture that says, whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son does not have life. I've written these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. God says you can know. 
So as I shared the good news with him, he kind of leaned in close. You know, he was slightly drunk, but you know, most of the people that were out there were. And as we were talking, it became apparent that he knew the way he should go. He understood the gospel. But he was being hindered by his desire to cling to the world. His desire to cling to that bottle that was under his arm. So he asked me a bunch of different questions that were kind of honestly irrelevant to the conversation. But at this point, I was starting to wonder if I was just wasting my time. And the next thing I know, he kind of pulled me aside off of the little walkway area and he set his booze down on the ground beside um, the trash can. And I thought to myself, okay, this dude's either going to punch me in the face or he really is serious. And so Ramon looked at me and he said, I'm ready to surrender my life to Christ. Now, let me tell you the most amazing thing about that. At that moment, Ramon became just as stone cold sober as you and I. The Holy Spirit had to do that, folks. And in fact, I was kind of shocked about it. I actually tried to talk him out of it. But it was clear that he wanted to surrender his heart to Jesus. And so we prayed together. And Ramon just kind of went on down the way looking for his brother. But guess what? The alcohol stayed there at the trash can. And he never came back for it. Kind of reminds me of the woman at the well when she was there at the well drawing water. The Bible says she left her burden behind and went into the village to tell everybody about Jesus. Ramon left his burden behind. And I want to say this today. You can leave your burden at the cross today. You can leave it behind if you're willing to repent of your sins and put your faith in Christ. But this encounter is a, a clear demonstration of how the Holy Spirit will work through our witness if we are faithful to be the witness. And that's the key right there. Are we faithful to proclaim the good news of Jesus? I want to go back to this scripture that I read a little bit earlier. Romans chapter 10 verse 14. It says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? Now don't get hung up on that word preaching. Because essentially in the original language it means to herald or to proclaim. How can they hear unless someone proclaims Jesus to them? God probably could have chosen another way, but he didn't. He chose me and you. God wants to use you as a herald to proclaim the gospel. And again, it says you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're none of His. And so therefore, you have what you need to tell your neighbor, your family member, your friend, your enemy about Jesus. Will you? Join me as we go to God in prayer. Father, what a glorious day we have to worship you and praise you and thank you for all that you have done. And Lord God, we just want to come to you today and we want to say thank you, first of all, for the cross. Thank you for the place on which my Savior went and bled and died for my sin. And Lord, I thank you that that was not the end of the story, that he was placed in the tomb and on the third day he rose again. And now he's sitting, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Lord, that's a message that we are to proclaim that forgiveness of sins and eternal life is available through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be faithful to that. And Lord, if we feel guilty about not doing it, you know, that's okay, that's understandable. But let's get beyond those feelings of guilt and actually go out there and start doing it. 
Start sharing. Start witnessing. Don't be like those 55% of Christians who never tell anybody about Jesus. Let's go. We have a wonderful privilege. In the scripture, you called us ambassadors for Christ. And we represent a kingdom that will never fail. And so God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today that you will just speak through their hearts and Lord, that you will just help them to be faithful in proclaiming the gospel. And Lord, for the one that's here today who's never trusted Christ as their Savior, I pray that you've been speaking through their hearts about this glorious gospel, this message of grace and mercy. Lord, mercy is when we don't get what we deserve. Grace is when we get what we do not deserve. And that's eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. So Father, you want to show mercy today and grace. You want to shower that upon the hearts of those who will believe. And so we're praying right now that your spirit is drawing and that whoever so will, whoever will, will call upon your name. Call upon the name of the Lord, it says, and you will be saved. Lord, thank you. We pray you bless us at this time as we prepare to have our time of invitation that people would respond to what you have said to them in their heart of hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, Brother Matthew, uh, I forgot your name, brother, but we're going to have our time of ascent, our song of invitation, which is come just as you are. So, if you would stand. And then, if the Lord has spoke to your heart today, I'll be down here to pray with you, uh, to help you in whatever way you need. kind attention today and for the opportunity to be here and share and uh, I would covet your prayers this week as we go out into the world and share the gospel and uh, particularly as we go to the abortion clinics this week because obviously it's going to be a lot more difficult now and you all are aware of that so uh, just be in prayer for the protection of our teams and uh, that God would be glorified in all that we do so Brother Matthew I'm going to turn it back over to you Thank you, uh, Pastor Darrell, for, for that. Um, it's really encouraging uh, to me, and I hope uh, to all of you it's encouraging as well to go, and uh, as you go, just to tell the, the message of Christ. Um, I want to uh, just make a little quick announcement before uh, I we dismiss in prayer. Um, I, I still need chaperones uh, for Camp Castle. I need a female chaperone. Uh, 21 or older uh, to to go with us. Uh, so if uh, you're you're a female, 21 or older, uh, we would love to have you join us uh, for Camp Castle. That's with the with the youth. Uh, also, uh, we need a male chaperone for Caraway, 18 or older. 
I know that for 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 a lot of y'all with chaperones, like, well, I got to take off work, and so uh, that that's understandable. Um, but it would be great. Uh, just uh, we need a chaperone for that since we have all boys. Um, if we had just six boys, then I could go, but we have we have eight going, so I just need one more chaperone uh, there with us for Caraway. Um, it would be a great time. I know that thinking about staying in the cabin with a bunch of boys uh, is, is hard. Uh, it can be, uh, but it's, it's also fun because some of those boys are, are hilarious. So um, just, uh, think about that and pray about that as you, uh, as you consider. Uh, so uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then after that we can be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you uh, for this day and this time you brought us here, Lord, thank you that, uh, that we can uh, go and, and find people uh, that need the gospel. Help us to have confidence uh, in the gospel as we go, uh, that we, we trust in, 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 in the work that you're doing in people's lives as we're telling, Lord. Remember that. We remember that we are just the messengers and you do all the work, and Lord, how much of a privilege it is to, to take this message. Uh, to the ends of the earth. So thank you for all that you can do for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.